record recording now send it over to you to make host change host here we go and jason will i do the countdown i'm sorry i just i'll decide when we start correct yeah mm -hmm. yep One moment. i would i would probably watch the attendee room first right um see how many we get yeah people start filing in like a minute before and then it starts getting pretty heavy a couple of minutes later so right. so before we get started how many of you guys have flown the joby or the beta any of you can you tell? From the Sims, from the Sims, but not the airplanes yet. Have people in your organization, Frank, flown them? That's what No, they... not yet. No, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we got to get through airworthiness before that happens. So. I'm wondering how that process worked. Yeah, we yeah, We'll talk about it today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about it. Hey Frank, are you are you aware of um of a SOCOM high speed vertical takeoff and landing initiative? I am. Yep. Okay. I, I know I know what they want. Okay. Um, whether physics allows it or not is still up for debate. But yeah. All right. All right. Copy. Be fun. I just uh, I had a chat with them last night. They're potentially looking to do um, a challenge related. Um, event with us. So, uh, and obviously this is, ties into agility prime and, you know, big air force. So I just want to make sure that the lines of communication aren't happening at all, at all levels. Yeah. I've, I've seen it come through AFRL channels that, you know, what, what they're looking for and things like okay. that. So it, it'll be interesting to watch. Okay. Well, great. Might be a project that Afrox takes on. Maybe. Hey okay. Jason, quick question yeah. for you. Uh, I will get to see all the attendees, their questions, right? Uh, yes. And so then I'll be able to ask them. Right, so just click on the Q&A tab at the bottom. Okay. That will bring up all the Q&As. Um, and um, yeah. I, I always encourage any one of the, uh, the panelists can just answer questions if they want to, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. feel free to do that too. I think people enjoy that allows us to get through more assuming we have it. Typically what I what I do um, with webinars is take all of the questions uh, as they come in at the end. So go through your presentations, have that conversation and yeah. then carve out time at the end and start going through the questions from the top to the bottom. And I usually call out the name of the person who uh, asks or entered the question so that they know that you're answering their question, that's all. And Jason, one last question for me. I have to go to the next panel. So we are in breakout groups. So mm -hmm. everyone else will end and then I'll get sent back to the main room, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. The main room and Zoom are two different um, platforms. So you'll just- for That link. Yeah, so you'll just end this and then click on your link, your next link. Super, thank yep. you. Okay. Um, I'm going to stick around for the first five minutes in case you need any technical support. Um, so happy to be here. I'll just um, turn off my video and be on mute. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Um, two minutes to go. Okay. Kirsten, did you get the uh, bio by chance? I did. Thank you. Okay, good. Right. And for everybody, we did fly a uh, UAM surrogate last week. It looks a bit like a 60 year old helicopter, but it was a UAM surrogate. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> we, we will put an FAA pilot on a 60 year old uh, helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was good. It was good. Uh, a couple lessons learned from that one, which actually will help. So.
Learn by doing, right, Dave? Yep. One so, minute. From the imagined. All right, let's see how many people we have and we're ready to go. We've got about 15 attendees. It's 3.05, everyone maybe 30 more seconds and we'll give it a start. Okay. Ready to go? Ready. Okay, perfect. All right, welcome to AppWorks Accelerate's afternoon session. where We were talking about um, orb operations and certification. So I've got a distinguished panel with me today. I'm very excited to be with them. In fact, I feel quite intimidated, um, which is not usual, uh, but I look forward to the conversation. Uh, my name is Kirsten Bartok. I'm with a firm called Air Finance and Air Finance Ventures. We provide financing for the aerospace industry and we have a early stage venture fund. We also make investments. Um, my distinguished colleagues here are both from the Air Force and the FAA, and we're looking forward to an interesting conversation about operations and certification. So I'm gonna let each of them go forward and introduce themselves. And then we're going to start with um, Frank giving us a presentation and then followed by uh, Wes Ryan of the FAA with uh, David Weber, David Sula. So I will let you go. Uh, Frank, do you wanna start? Yeah. Uh, hi, Kirsten. Hi, everyone. I'm Frank Delsing. I am the uh, I'm the technical lead for Agility Prime. So that means I am responsible for airworthiness and test of the platforms. Um, so I've got my team uh, figuring out how to essentially get these aircraft up in the air on the Air Force's dime and start collecting data that uh, is relevant to both the companies and to the Air Force. So uh, my background is a is an Air Force uh, test pilot, C-130 test pilot, retired in 2015, and now I'm a civilian working in the Aerospace Systems Directorate, and uh, and happy to be here. All right, who wants to go next, <laughs> Dave or Wes? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Uh, so I'm Wes Ryan. I've been with the FA for about 18 years. Uh, I'm a, an aerospace engineer. I've been uh, in the aircraft certification service for the FAA, kind of leading technology initiatives. I'm currently the R&D manager for aircraft certification and uh, been working uh, inside and outside the FAA to try to enable this uh, future air mob mobility, uh, urban air mobility type of concepts for the last five years or so. And uh, just uh, have an aerospace engineering degree and master's degree from University of Kansas, but uh, have a flight test background as well a long time ago, different life, uh, but uh, Happy to be here today. Thanks for including me. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, I'm David Weber. Uh, I'm a uh, research uh, flight test engineer and certification engineer with the FAA. I work closely with uh, David Cizo and, and Wes Ryan, uh, particularly interested in new and novel technologies. I've, I've spent about half my career, about 15 years in the research world. I worked with Wes a long time ago out at uh, NASA, Dryden and the last 15 years uh, I've, I've been working uh, certification and finding compliance under uh, the regulatory environment. And here in the, um, you know, the waning years of my career, I'm, uh, I'm bringing those two skill sets together to hopefully enable urban air mobility. So uh, right, right now, my, my chief job is, uh, is I'm basically chief architect for the uh, NASA uh, Advanced Air Mobility National Campaign a flight test plan. We're trying to use a UAM surrogate and work with participant UAM vehicles to figure out the vehicle characteristics, tie that into infrastructure uh, and airspace in order to enable urban air mobility. Very cool. All right, Dave Cizo, uh, you're last. Hi, Dave Cizo. I'm a flight test pilot with the FAA in the central section. And I've been with the FAA for about uh, 12 years. I've been deeply involved in developing uh, means of compliance for eVTOL uh, aircraft certification. Work very closely with Wes and Dave Weber and excited to uh, collaborate with the Air Force Agility uh, Prime. Background, uh, prior to the FAA, I was a FA, uh, sorry, an Air Force test pilot uh, with uh, F-35 and F-16s. Flew A-10s prior to that, 
also did a stint at Gulfstream as a test pilot. Happy to be here. Like I said, an incredibly distinguished group. Um, Frank, you've got a short presentation for us and our team from the FAA, longer one. So Frank, do you want to start? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously the lone Air Force guy surrounded by the FAA. So talk about being intimidated, I'm a little bit nervous, but that's okay. I'll, I'll try and make it through this. Uh, but I, I thought I would, what I'd start off is just kind of uh, sharing with everyone kind of an update on where we are with respect to airworthiness on the Agility Prime program itself. Uh, so I'm going to run through a couple slides that should look familiar if uh, if you participated in or you watched the kickoff that we had back in April. Um, but what it does is it lays the foundation for uh, for what we're doing so everybody understands. I wanted to start off by, since we do have FAA and Air Force uh, airworthiness kind of mixing on this panel, just wanted to lay out kind of the similarities and differences you see between the two approaches. So uh, most people are pretty familiar with the FAA approach, uh, which is, as you can see, uh, um, based on 14 CFR, you get your different parts there, uh, and you walk away with a type certificate, or if you're, uh, if you're making something specific uh, change or something, then you get the supplemental type certificate. But that's kind of the ultimate goal is that type certificate. So when somebody says that they have a certified platform from an airworthiness perspective, that's generally what they're talking about is that, that type certificate. Uh, really the same goes on the FA or on the uh, uh, Air Force side of things. When we talk about a certified platform, we're talking about something that has a military type certificate. So the two are uh, pretty synonymous. We you have a different um, standard that we use. The Mill Handbook 516C provides our standards versus 14 CFR, but really, for the most part, they're very, very similar. There are some differences, but uh, for the most part, they overlap a lot. Um, most of the differences you see are in the obvious places like munitions. You're not going to find very many munitions uh, standards in the FAA, but uh, obviously you will in the, in the Air Force and things like that. The, the differences I want to highlight, though, um, so in the, in the FAA, uh, when you build a, a prototype platform and you want to go out and start flying, you start with an experimental ticket, or sometimes it's called an X ticket. And what that is is an application to the FAA to fly your platform within some very specific limitations in terms of where you can fly it and how you can fly it. And it's based on uh, an application and a submission uh, under what's called a program letter. Uh, and then that uh, allowance uh, is is what you see most of the most of the guys flying today on the FAA side of things uh, on their X ticket. Now in the Air Force we don't have the equivalent of an X ticket um, because the the big the big disconnect on the experimental ticket is that it's not uh, it's not um, evaluated against a, a set of criteria. So there's no compliance that goes with an X ticket, um, and because of that the Air Force can't can't really accept that um, just hands hands down. But on the flip side, the Air Force has something that's uh, kind of an intermediate step between the two where we have a military flight release. And what that is is a kind of a risk-based approach using 516C and the standards there as a guide, but it gives us the ability to evaluate a design against the standards, but um, looking at it where, you know, in many time, in many ways, if, especially on a prototype or an x or something like that, we're expecting there to be non-compliances. And so we can go and fly these things with a full, what we call an airworthiness assessment against the design. Uh, it doesn't get you to the full flight uh, military type certificate, but, what it, but it's that intermediate step where we've evaluated the design against a set of standards, and then we can walk away uh, and provide our leadership, the operational side of things, the knowledge of what risk level there is in, in flying that. So that, those are kind of the big differences and similarities between those. And so I'm going to use that language when I talk about where we are today with respect to the players on Agility Prime. So uh, if you've been listening all along, um, you know that uh, the reason we're here is I want to help the companies get to their FAA Airworthiness certification. Because again, we're all about on Agility Prime, building out that uh, that market in the U.S. Uh, so that the idea being, if we if we help establish that market, number one, we're going to get the technology developed uh, for multi-use kind of things, and we can leverage that market in the future without having to invest a typical what you've seen in the past with respect to um, the Air Force taking a huge chunk of money 
developing a set of requirements based on a specific mission with key performance parameters and key system attributes and things like that. And then there's specification compliance, all these kinds of things. We, we don't want to go there on, on, on the EV tall space simply because a, a lot of the technology is getting developed without us. So we don't want to be left out, but at the same time, there's really no point in us jumping in and trying to be the big guy on the block because it's not going to work in this case. So we'd rather collaborate out there, help help the companies get to their FAA type certificate and find ways that we can learn along the way with them uh, so that we can eventually get to both FAA type certificate. And uh, should we find a, a dual use capability there, get to a military type certificate that we can uh, leverage in the future. So uh, that. That's kind of the, the big picture from an airworthiness perspective on why we're doing what we're doing and, and how we're getting there. So um, you may recognize this. This was the airworthiness uh, visual notes from our uh, kickoff last April. I wish I could take notes like this, but I have no artistic talent like this. But uh, you can see there kind of uh, a summary of what we talked about last April. So where we are today, I, you know, you, you probably heard it or maybe you read it um, today that Joby is kind of the first out of the gate with our airworthiness assessments. And I'm proud to say that our airworthiness team in 47 days has done their first look at the Joby design. So we've uh, we've gone through the different high level sections from 516C and we've put together our design assessment of of their uh, prototype. And uh, we have submitted it for uh, review from the Air Force Airworthiness Office. So we're, we're, we've finished the report, we've assembled all the information, and now we've submitted it for approval. So we're hoping to get that approval soon, and that will allow us to then go fly under an MFR, like we talked about earlier, uh, kind of construct where we can do specific flight test-oriented kind of things on their vehicle on the Air Force's dime. So, uh, and Joby's not the only one in that in that pipeline. We've got some other players in there that are progressing as well. Um, but I'm I'm happy to announce that we've made significant process progress in in a really a very short time from a typical airworthiness timeline. So, uh, just want to throw that out there and uh, get everyone up to speed and uh, and open for any questions either now or later on. I'm going to ask one quick question, then we're going to go on to our FAA team. So, Frank, that's yeah. super interesting and impressive. 47 days, that's a lot. That's actually a short amount of time is what I meant to say. How long yeah, do you hugely. expect between now and, uh, or I should say, and getting the MFR, and then between the MFR and where you might be to the MTC? Yeah, so from here to the MFR, it's really a matter of running through the approval process. So we need to take it to the kind of the division level, answer their questions about the design, then we take it to uh, to Mr. Fisher, to our uh, technical airworthiness authority for the Air Force for his sign off on the design. So assuming that we've sufficiently answered the questions in our report and you know, inevitably, you, no matter how long your report is, somebody's gonna have a question that's not answered in there. So we're gonna have discussions there, we're gonna run through it. I expect us to uh, be able to fly in, in you know, early 2021. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I think we're going to get those questions answered. Joby's been spectacular in, uh, in providing information that we need on their design. And, and really, I would hope that uh, the questions that we've asked on their design has helped prepare them um, as kind of a practice round for when they start answering those questions officially for SCORE with the FAA when they get to their type certified design. So that's, that's kind of the bonus to both sides of that. As far as getting to a military type certificate, uh, it's going to be a while. Um, you know, for a military type certificate, now you're running through specification compliance. So just like on the FAA side of things, now you have to assemble the data, you have to assemble the artifacts, the modeling, the simulation, the analysis, the flight test data, all those things have to come together and you have to spell those out against your specific uh, criteria that you're looking for. So that's, that's gonna be a little more kind of medium term to get to a full military type certificate. Um, but in the meantime, the MFR that we have really allows us to do a lot of things uh, to include collecting data, to verify models that we have, start looking at some missions that we can apply these things to uh, and all kinds of all kinds of opportunities there on the Air Force's time. So it's a huge deal for us. So have, have, I assume the military has gone through this um, MFR phase to the MT, MTC phase. 
I know you hate to put a time around it and no one's going to hold you to it, but does that typically take a year, assuming the company on the other side provided you the information and the data? Do we expect that we might have a military type certificate before, you know, the FAA timeline that we're all expecting, which is 2023 or just approximations is fine and no one will hold you to this? Yeah, so I wish I could. Um, it really comes down to the design and what they have. You know, the, uh, you don't normally put a prototype aircraft up for a type certificate because right. it's not intended for that. So uh, until I have a type certified or type certifiable design, um, it's hard to say how long it would take to get there. I would say that because the companies that we're working with, their primary business plan is not to build an aircraft for the Air Force. Their primary business plan is to get out there in the commercial market and start achieving commercial viability. So I would fully expect, and uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not trying to push any of these companies one way or the other, but I would fully expect them to go for their FAA type certificate first. So I would expect them to get that type certificate start, uh, you know, start flying for profit uh, out there in the commercial world. And then we can take that and leverage that for our military type certificate on the backside. Excellent. All right. We'll have more questions for you later, but uh, let's go right. on to the and the days. Okay. Let me uh, share my screen here. Let's see. Able to see my slides and hear me okay? Yes, sounds great. So th thank you, Frank. That was an excellent uh, so sort of segue into our presentation. Uh, just from our perspective, this is all about the partnership of leveraging uh, both of our organizations to try to keep moving the technology going forward, whether it's the core development of some of the enablers or the whole airframe. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, we, we don't expect to type design prototypes, but we want to move those prototypes to certifiable designs. And we're really excited about the possibilities of partnering and, and you know, achieving those results between the FAA, NASA, uh, the Air Force and, and industry. So I'll, I'll start off kind of, you know, very similar to your talk, talking about uh, what is airworthiness certification from the FAA's perspective. And you, you kind of hit on it already. You basically said that you're military airworthiness is, you know, getting to a point where if it's just the flight release, it's it's safe to fly for some limited purposes, but if it has a, a type certificate, it's met a series of specifications and actually demonstrated that it meets those uh, requirements. In a very similar process, as you mentioned, the FAA goes through this process to gain what we call safety assurance, that a product is not only a, a mature prototype and a viable product to bring to type certification, but it has, it has gone through the requirements and showings of compliance and flight tests to show that it's safe for repeatable, reliable, regular use in some type of civil service. And as you mentioned, Joby and all the other companies that are working in this new advanced air mobility space, their goal is you know, from air, uh, air cargo to air taxi services to moving people uh, rapidly around short range missions in, in cities, dense air traffic. So there's a lot of things that still have to come to a level of maturity from a core enabler technology standpoint, whether it's the detect and avoid technologies, the auto flight technologies, uh, you know, automatic ground collision. These are all things that are building blocks, if you will, to make those uh, future types of operations uh, come to a, a real fruition in, in reality. And so we are looking, you know, under our new regulatory structure with our uh, Amendment 64 to Part 23, we purposely laid a foundation where some of these new ideas could come into the FA and begin working. And we have our Center for Emerging Concepts that's working right now with several companies, uh, active type certification programs. We're basically applying a level of certification rigor based on the intended mission and the type of use for the aircraft. So we look at how it's used, where it's gonna fly, all those things. And that kind of dictates the requirements for us. And we also realize that our job not only is to enforce regulations and, and the standards for airworthiness and for safe use, but to also make sure that we're moving in a pace that is an innovative pace uh, and trying to keep up with uh, industry, which everybody knows is uh, very difficult to do in a 
highly regulated uh, industry just because we have to make sure that as we take these incremental steps towards the future, we're doing so safely. So today, um, our intent of this group is to just kind of share some of our own experience um, with Dave Cizo and Dave Weber and myself of bringing new products to certification. And the key is multidiscipline teams. And, and I'm sure you have the same experience where you get your systems and flight tests and, and avionics people and the human factors people and the whole, you know, the operational integration, all those groups together. And they go through this process. And we start with the experimental R&D process, um, allowing a company to essentially take a uh, responsibility for the airworthiness of their aircraft to go do some initial testing and product development. And then that when they get to a certain stage of maturity, they switch over to an experimental show compliance airworthiness certificate, which shows us that the aircraft is in a, in a mature state of design and ready for the FAA to, to evaluate. And that's at that point where we get really heavily involved in the flight test work and the compliance work. We're obviously trying to engage as early as possible so that there's a clear regulatory path and a clear uh, path for the, the requirements um, as we, we move towards these, these future systems. And the key is for us to gain some type of experience with the new technologies, with the proposed aircraft, with their type of operations. And sometimes we do that by, as you mentioned, kind of with your military flight release is we do limited uh, airworthiness and limited operations sometimes in the beginning as a new design comes online so that we can safely take it from concept to de through development and then into operation. And so I'd like to segue here to uh, Dave Cizo and have him kind of explore a little bit of his experience in working through um, some of the recent testing and development of requirements, uh, specifically in the area of how these aircraft are gonna be flown and controlled. Dave Cizo, off to you. Yeah, thanks Wes. So uh, both the military and the FAA have the same high level goal, right? It's airworthiness of vehicles. Um, but as, as Frank talked about uh, military flight release, and Mill Handbook uh, 516 Charlie, there are some differences between the details uh, of that process and what the FAA uses for certification of aircraft. So I just have one slide here, uh, just talk to a, uh, a new approach that the FAA is embarking on for the certification of EV tall aircraft. And that is, Mission Task Elements, or MTEs. Um, when the FAA certified fly-by-wire aircraft, you know, Boeing, Airbus, as well as all the uh, business jets, we used special conditions. And it, it works, but it's onerous and it's unique to use a special condition for every design. So the new approach that we're embarking on now is uh, leveraging what the military did with advanced helicopter designs, and that is ADS-33. The document was published over 20 years ago and was used for the military to accept, as I mentioned, uh, advanced helicopters. So the uh, Dave Weber and, and, and I and, and our team looked at that document and said, how can we adapt ADS-33 to civilian certification. Clearly the missions are different, uh, but overall, again, the high level goal is, is airworthiness. So that's what we've done. Um, we are developing mission task elements. And, and what are mission task elements? Simply stated, it's a repeatable test, could be a flight test or a simulation test that is used to assess handling qualities to look for cliffs for handling qualities, as well as safe operation in, operational integration into the national airspace system. What is really cool about this, this new approach is that we can use this to assess optionally piloted vehicles, as well as vehicles with high levels of uh, automation integration. So in summary, MTEs are another tool in our tool bag to achieve FAA certification, but MTEs could also be applied to the military airworthiness process. I'll pause there uh, if there are any questions or we can circle back at the end of the presentation. Okay, back to you, Wes. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so 
that's a great uh, uh, you know description of, of really getting down into the nuts and bolts of evaluating a particular aircraft, its intended use, and then designing some of the requirements for airworthiness and certification around the actual way that the aircraft is intended to be used. And so we have a lot of work going on that, that Dave mentioned, uh, Dave Cizo mentioned, and I'd like to talk a little bit in, in the next little bit here about some of the other partnerships. That was some of, some of the internal research that the FAA is doing in, in collaboration with NASA to look at some specific design aspects. But we also realized that these partnerships um, are very key to the success of the core development of some of the core technologies. And we have a lot of overlap between our unmanned aircraft uh, core technology development programs and some of the ones being developed to uh, enhance the advanced air mobility in the future for passenger carrying aircraft. So we have the Assure program that the FAA is heavily involved in for development of unmanned aircraft. We have the partnership of Agility Prime with NASA. These are really kind of the, the way where the rubber meets the road for us to be able to go do some testing on an experimental aircraft to develop maybe uh, you know small uh, power, low power detect and avoid technologies for low altitude, small unmanned aircraft use, or the auto flight systems, as Dave was mentioning, and, and you know the research going into how the the uh, aircraft is flown to perform certain functions during the mission to make sure that those flight path control systems are capable of those type, types of uh, operations. So these, these collaborations are very useful for us. And I know um, uh, Dave Weber has been heavily involved in our work with NASA on the national campaign. So I will transition to Dave Weber now and have him describe some of the work that he's been doing there. Thanks a lot, Wes. Um, yeah, so, so one common theme um, we've heard from everybody who's, who's spoken so far, and, and including um, uh, uh, Frank, is, is the idea of a set of standards uh, that, that can be used in order to grant airworthiness. Well, those set of standards, you, you can imagine it's not a one size fits all. It's very dependent on the mission itself. And, uh, and the big question is the, um, uh, well, what is the urban air mobility and or advanced air mobility mission? Um, NASA, the same words, it, it, the different groups are using different words, but in NASA, NASA is um, uh, re referring to advanced air mobility national campaign. It's a large project. It's going to go many, many years. And uh, we're focusing initially on urban air mobility, which is uh, basically passenger carrying ops uh, in the urban environment. And we're focusing on, on several areas to, to try to figure out what are the appropriate standards that will enable those vehicles to fly that mission? So um, uh, you'll see the word mission quite a bit, uh, both in, uh, in, in David Cizo talking about mission task elements, which we're looking at, uh, taking an early look at with the urban air mobility work we're doing with NASA. But uh, we're focusing on some several areas, uh, low speed controllability and performance in the urban environment. Uh, we're trying to, uh, in a, um, using a range uh, to, to take a look at the different elements that are important for the urban environment. We're, uh, we're coming up with some assumptions on the urban air mobility mission because uh, we really don't know exactly what it is yet. Uh, there's some unique physical constraints of the vehicles that, that, that we're seeing and we're trying to figure out how those will practically be used in the urban environment. And we're recognizing um, the, 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 that there's an economic side to this as well. Ultimately, the dollar per seat mile is critical for urban air mobility to, pardon the pun, get off the ground. So we're looking at condensed urban air mobility um, approaches in, uh, in, we're assuming instrument meteorological conditions will be necessary. That may not be right out of the gate when they first start flying, but we do expect that to happen shortly thereafter in order to give them uh, economic viability. And what we're doing is we're, we're using an anchor and evolve strategy. So instead of just putting out uh, research uh, reports, which come up with new acronyms and new ways of saying things, we want to make our research findings relevant. And so we want to tie to existing regulatory standards, advisory circulars, what have you, and present that uh, how those standards need to evolve in order to enable urban air mobility. Thanks, Wes. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, one of the things that uh, Dave is, is highlighting here that's so important is that if we have an aircraft that has a very different capability as far as flight or 
different limitations, such as if an air traffic controller needs an aircraft to halt its flight path and hover in the air to wait for other traffic, some of these eVTOL aircraft may not have the battery capacity to do that. So the testing and, and the work that we're doing in this collaboration that Dave Weber was talking about, it's really important because if the procedures need to change or if the assumed procedures for air traffic integration are very different than what's expected, um, then that could disrupt the system. So we have to be very careful as we design, build, and certify these aircraft with the industry uh, that, that we're making sure that our procedures and our air traffic integration can handle those types of changes and that we're ready for it. And uh, so this is really important work that, that Dave's been doing. Um, that's really the end of uh, the, the presentation that formally that I had. Um, we have several other areas we could go into um, just in the Q&A, but I wanted to, to stop here and either just kind of open the floor or see if there's any uh, particular questions that are in the Q&A. So back to you, Kirsten. I've had a question that I'm gonna start asking uh, some of our, and thank you guys for answering the question as we go. Some, um, let's say VTOL companies are thinking they have an advantage because the FAA hasn't yet come out with means of compliance. So for example, while a Joby has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in years partnering with you to come up with these cases and work with you to develop the means of compliance. There are other uh, VTOL startups that are saying, we're just gonna wait for the FAA to come out with those means of compliance and then we'll build our aircraft to those specs. How do you answer that question? Well, I'd, I'd love to take a stab at that one just because uh, that one's a very common approach. Uh, we have two types of companies in the certified product world. We have those who are willing to work with the FAA, work through the difficult regulatory barriers and technology challenges to be first to market. There's a big advantage to that, but there are some disadvantages. Um, you know, there are companies, for example, who have worked with us to certify uh, emergency auto land systems for certified products, uh, you know, and other, other capabilities. Those projects were not easy and they did, you know, require an investment on behalf of, of the industry to, to accomplish those. But uh, I will say that those that blaze the trail get not only the, the market share of, of being first to market, but also they get the, the bragging rights, if you will, of saying that they were first to be able to do something. So I, I understand why people are sort of waiting in the wings to see what the final answer is. The unfortunate side effect though of that is that we may be missing out on some good ideas that they might be able to bring to the table that are slightly different. They may have a different approach or a new and novel approach to solving an existing problem that all of the industry is struggling with. And so really what we've been encouraging is instead of having people wait in the wings, we've been asking them to engage in the ind industry standards development process and to come into those bodies to try to share some common ideas, common themes and work forward uh, towards a common solution without sharing so much where they're giving away any secret sauce or anything like that. Uh, and the industry groups have been helping with us or helping us with that as well. Gamma has a very active group of, of uh, companies that are working to try to find some common solutions. Uh, ASTM has some groups that are working, SAE and RTCA, other standards bodies are also working through that process with us. But uh, I totally understand why they wanna wait, uh, but we've been encouraging people, come talk to the FAA through our Center for Emerging Concepts get the ball rolling and maybe we can find a solution faster. And I'll add on to what Wes just said, um, you know, the part 23 rewrite uh, that removed the prescriptive language from the regulations allows industry to have a seat at the table and have input into developing means of compliance, whether they be a consensus standard or a, their own proprietary means of compliance. So, because the FAA can't uh, react to new and novel technology as fast as we want, we want to collaborate with industry to develop those consensus standards and means of compliance. And I'll add one more to that. Uh, um, so, and on the AAM national campaign, we're recognizing the, uh, the hesitance that Wes talked about, about uh, people per, perhaps wanting to come and share their secrets to us. So we're going out and proactively um, collaborating with other partners to uh, challenge the, these individuals 
and, and try to discern uh, what their vehicle characteristics are so we can feed those into standards organizations and back to ourselves and, and, and others. I want to get to some questions. Um, we've got one up here. Are the same regulatory pathway concepts applied for novel propulsion systems in both military and the FAA? Yeah, I, I tried to answer that one in the chat a little bit, but I'll elaborate. Um, you know, for any new technology, uh, the FAA may have its ideas of how that technology can be brought safely to a civil use case. And it may involve particular design and certification requirements. But we also have built into that levels of safety and levels of development assurance for software, for hardware, for hardness against, you know, um, uh, EMI and external uh, radio frequency interference and lightning protection, those kinds of things. So I would say that from my experience, a lot of the core um, requirements and core safety uh, uh, requirements and regulations that would be added, the language might be very similar for those things between a, a military certification and a civilian certification, as uh, Frank was saying earlier, that you know there's a lot of similarity in the language. But oftentimes where the detail is different is in the level of rigor or the expected levels of safety, reliability, integrity, accuracy. Sometimes those numbers are different for a repeatable, reliable civil use than they would be for a military use. Yeah, and I'll also say that uh, on the military side of things, a lot of times when we're dealing with new technologies that maybe aren't explicitly called out in 516C or the specifications or certification uh, language that we have, we're looking for equivalent levels of, of safety that we can draw between those. And that's part of the, you know, the initial process of going for a military type certificate is to, is, is to lay out the tailored airworthiness certification criteria. So we take and we look at all the 516C areas that may or may not apply and we identify early on where there are gaps and, and then work with the companies to decide, okay, if there's a gap here, you know, uh, how, can we, how can we show an equivalent level of safety that might show us the same kind of assurances that we would otherwise have if we were using more traditional methods? I'm gonna to go to Alex's question here. On the regulation side, what has the FAA had to change or come up with new ways of doing things beyond leveraging the military to go faster and enable certification of new and emerging technologies? Well, that's, that's a really interesting question. You know, the, the easy answer to that question is we have a lot of blank pieces of paper that we're filling in right now on different technologies, whether it's detect and avoid technology or, uh, you know, automatic ground collision avoidance or, you know, uh, full-time flight path control systems that are you know, relatively new to, to civil products where we have fly-by-wire that's been around for a long time, but in a civil use case, it's a very different um, prospect. So, you know, we don't, we have a, a long list of specific areas of area, you know, for methods of compliance that we're working, uh, you know, for the automation on the aircraft or the systems that are allow the safe integration of the aircraft into the airspace. Um, and many of those things are still relatively blank pieces of paper because we're still proving out what technology is capable of. Um, you know, testing some of the core sensors, testing some of the, the core capabilities and to see what those technical maturity levels are. The, uh, the interesting thing is we have what I would call a supply chain of components in the civil aviation world where if I'm building a typical part 23, you know, passenger carrying or recreational aircraft, I can go buy a display or a, an attitude reference system or an autopilot off the shelf and so all I'm really building is the new airplane frame. I've got propellers, engines I can choose from. But in this space with this new kind of advanced air mobility, there are a whole bunch of technologies that have not been brought to a mature state yet. And so that supply chain, if you will, of those building blocks doesn't exist. So the companies are having to start with those blank pieces of paper as well and do the core technology development along with the development of their airframes. And so there's, there's some big challenges there. We've got one minute left and I'm gonna kind of do a broad question, AI autonomy. I, I don't envy your jobs because you're working with new propulsion, new airframes and now add autonomy in it. It's like, I mean, and, and now you've got no longer anything that's prescriptive, right? So it's performance-based. So how are you attacking that? 
So that's one of my favorite questions because uh, you know we've been working for several years now to try to enable uh, in a very safe manner and a very controlled manner, the use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'll basically answer the question in three points. One is really to define what you mean by AI and ML because they can be many things to different people. And for a civil application, what we're seeing is a lot of the technologies that people will call artificial intelligence or machine learning, all they are is really just you know algorithms that run in the background to help optimize the performance of either the aircraft or assist the pilot in one of the tasks that they're doing. Yep. But when we start to get into true you know, artificial intelligence or adaptive systems or learning systems, we started working uh, over five years ago with uh, ASTM to put a, a first standard in place, which is really an architectural standard. It wasn't a design standard, but it was for adaptive systems. And the idea in that standard my second point is to bound the behavior of these systems that come out onto the aircraft so that we know that they won't hurt the aircraft, but they can be put you know, on the aircraft, making a good safety case for the improvement that they're gonna to bring to the aircraft, whether it's helping the pilot do a task better or to begin to show that the automation is ready to take some of those tasks away from the pilot. And that's really my third point is that we have to take a very task oriented view of how AI and ML is, is put on the aircraft. Um, we have to make sure that we are a, have a clear understanding of the shared role, if there is a shared role between the human and the machine. And if we're asking the AI and ML to do a control function, that's one thing that we can put some bounds on and make sure that it's bounded and that it's behaving nicely. But when we start to ask that technology to do perceptive tasks, that's where we really have some work to do. And so um, we're making progress on some draft uh, internal thoughts and policy in that area. We're working with industry. Um, we're, we've got some research with NASA under a resilient autonomy program with the DOD and them that's basically looking at developing some core architectures to make systems behave in a more robust manner. And that those types of projects are really uh, helpful for us to make some ground on the core policy issues and the the core design requirements for that safe introduction. Well, I, I think unfortunately our time is up and I know I could have got on for a long time asking our esteemed, uh, our esteemed panelists questions. So appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure how to get in touch with you after, but I'm sure we'll all be bothering you at the FAA and Agility Prime for more guidance. So thank you all for your work and commitment. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. Yeah.